Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's panel discussion on a topic which is rapidly gaining momentum. Oil and gas are back big time. After years of uncertainty and a challenging downturn, we are witnessing a robust resurgence in the oil and gas sector. This revival has sparked a surging demand for offshore vessels of all types and sizes, creating a dynamic environment filled with both challenges and opportunities. We are fortunate to have here with us today a panel of distinguished experts, leaders from across the industry who bring deep expertise in operations, finance and market strategy. I'm excited to hear their insights and thoughts on how to navigate these dynamic markets and what lies ahead for the offshore shipping sector. Thank you for being here today. Without further ado, let's plunge into the questions. So my first question is for you, Martin. Um, BW Offshore has a strong presence in the highly competitive FPSO sector. How do you think ship owners can balance the financial reward, risks and rewards in an environment of rising demand, but also increased scrutiny on environmental and sustainability practices? It's an, uh, it's an interesting question. And you say there's rising demand. And going back to your original statement, oil and gas is back. It never really went away, but there's been a hiatus while well, there's been some analysis of the sens sensitivities around uh, energy demand. But in the FPSO sector, which actually I'm not sure I would describe as highly competitive because there are a reduced number of players with that specific uh, experience able to do new, new projects, it's quite interesting to see to look at what's happened this year. Usually by this point in the year, there'd have been 10 or 12 FPSO awards. This year, there's been three. But at the same time, there was probably higher demand potential than any other time in the sector at all, which leaves Andrew and I and our respective colleagues scratching our heads. Kind of, so how does this, this actually turn into, into contracts? And that's something which well, I, 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 we'll, we'll come to. But when you, but when you talk about uh, risks and rewards, because of the nature of the business that we're in, it's a highly, highly disciplined industry already. So the fact that there is higher demand potential than previous years doesn't mean that we will take more risks. Um, we, we have to look and be very, very careful about every aspect to, uh, to a project, from the client to the technical, to the commercial, to the financial, to the legal, etc. So I think it's actually a pretty, um, uh, the, 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 the demand doesn't really affect the risks that we will take. Would, would you agree with that? Well, I was gonna ask, do you worry that um, with all the, I see a lot of European bankers in the audience, but with the sort of increased stress, uh, or focus on, on ESG and, and the exit of liquidity from the financing market is the reason that we don't have more tenders awarded because of the capital constraints? Very good question, and I think so, and I think you'll probably have the same answer as I'm about to give, which is uh, one of the reasons for that lag in contract awards has been supply chain cost, but also finance cost. And the finance cost has been a little bit driven by uh, capacity, ESG trends amongst our uh, valued banking relationships. And that's part, part of the squeeze there, I think. So, yeah, if, if that answers uh, how you see that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we do need to, and I've, I've spoken about this before, we do need to explore other areas of, of capital, whether that's leasing, whether that's going to non-traditional lenders, non-traditional banks, or even thinking about the capital markets. Um, but I think if you take that view, then there is sufficient capital. And actually what we need to do is find contracts that are financeable. So we need to uh, put some pressure on the charterers to think about where is the market today. We are not in the previous oil cycles. You need to have a view on milestone or advanced payments. You need to have a view on variation orders. Um, and you need to provide a contract that lenders can really hang their hats on, take back to their committees, in addition to the ESG agenda, but also from a, from a pure credit perspective that is a bankable contract. That is going to be the key to ensuring the, the future success of this industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. Actually, that leads us directly on to my second question, which was for you. Um, Andrew, so we have seen in recent years a significant and sustained retreat in support for the offshore shipping market from traditional bank and ECA funders. So in the wake of this challenging financing environment, Insan Production has had really good degree of success in raising bond capital. So in your view, have the bond markets now become a reliable alternative source of capital for offshore asset owners? And do you think they will continue to grow in prominence as an alternative capital source? I, I very much hope so. I think the, the bond markets offer three real advantages to us as an industry. Um, the first one being sort of third-party verification. And so we've seen the eight rating agencies, both uh, Moody's and uh, Fitch, put out reports. And we, we ended up with a, with a credit rating that was one notch higher than the underlying off-taker. So we have a, a single asset bond uh, that was uh, charted to Petrobras for more than 20 years. And that came out at a double B plus, one notch higher than the actual off-taker. You know, for me, that is really verification that what we say, where we position ourselves in the value chain, is really right at the top of the pyramid. Petrobras will be more than happy to default on its own bonds before defaulting on their FPSO contract because we are really the tap at the pinnacle of the value chain on that oil field. Without us, there is no oil, there is no cash, there is no revenue. So having a third-party agency recognize that and, and really deliver the uptick in credit rating, I think, is tremendously valuable for our industry as a whole, as people slowly familiarize, investors slowly familiarize themselves with FPSOs. And I know there have been other issuances, but there is a very large investor base. And probably that's, that's the second point, which is the depth of liquidity. Banks, as we've, as we've seen, some are exiting, some are coming in, but generally you have very, very finite credit limits. The capital markets really, you know, is an order of magnitude deeper. And so, in addition to having the depth of liquidity, we're also able to return liquidity to our core relationship banks. We have been able to return several hundred million dollars to, our, to the banks that have supported us through construction, and that will get recycled and that will get reinvested into, into another, hopefully another FPSO asset. I think finally, is really matching the length of these contracts with the type of financing. So as much as we want to push our lenders, they can, they can at maximum do five, six, seven years. The, the bond that we issued was an 18-year instrument, and that really captures significantly more of the value in the contract. I think being able to hang your hat on that contract to say Petrobras is going to be a reliable payer, this is a very long-term view, and it means I don't have to worry about refinancing risk, particularly, and that's crucially important for FPSOs. Unlike many of the other, other asset classes that have been discussed in this forum, these are not liquid assets. If I wanted to monetize an FPSO because I've got a refinancing wall coming up, I'm going to be stuck. And that is going to cause material damage to the, to the business. So um, I think those three benefits are reason enough for us to continue to invest time and efforts in, in developing the capital markets. I hope other issuers will come to market. And once we have a real asset class and there's more trading, hopefully we'll narrow that spread, even though we have a better credit rating, but we'll hopefully narrow that spread to the underlying charters. Perfect. Well, do you see any other emerging trends um, in terms of financing, perhaps from um, PRC lease financing, from green financiers, from off-taker financiers sometimes? Do you see any of these other alternative forms of financing also rising to the fore? Yeah, I, I think just having a few conversations today, there are you know, some, some Chinese lessors here, um, other interesting pools of capital. We always have to balance... Uh, interest in this sector with actionability. And I think um, when we have exposure to Chinese fabrication, to Chinese construction, it makes sense to look towards the East for, for fundraising capabilities. Similarly, we have a lot of charterers, a lot of clients in Latin America, and I think we will see continued emergence of balance sheet from that part of the world as well. Um, but it really is incumbent on all of us to think very holistically around the, around the solution here. You can't just rely on ECAs, as, as you rightly pointed out. We have to wean ourselves off that a little bit. We have to wean ourselves off the relationship capital and start thinking about non-traditional options. And, uh, you know, it'll be a, as soon as one person develops a new structure, we'll all jump on it. And it just takes that, uh, a little bit of bravery to, to pull the trigger. 
Well, you've done some more interesting things this year than uh, any other FPS company. But I think just to add one other, one other pool of capital, which is a critical part of the funding mix, which is uh, the clients themselves. Um, their funding cost is going to be a lot lower than ours. And given the asset sizes and the capex that we're looking at, they, it, there is always a conversation to be had about the efficiencies in them taking part of that. Um, and, and it is a discussion that we start early and we have to start early um, because it takes a little bit of education, particularly when you come to other forms of funding than bank funding, uh, to structure it properly to make sure that everyone really understands how it fits together. The fewer strings that that capital comes with, the better, right? So oft, oftentimes they think, oh, we've, raised, we've got some capital allocated for an advance payment, for a milestone payment, but if it comes with all these strings attached, actually it disrupts the rest of your capital structure. So rather than additive, it is subtractive for an overall pool of capital perspective. So yeah, I think we do need to provide more education. Hopefully that the bankers in this room, as well as the, the uh, other asset owners, apply that pressure on our charterers to educate them. You know, they, we're all aligned. We want to build more vessels. We want to have long-term contracts working on, on fields and, and, and extracting the hydrocarbons from the ground. But we need to do it in a very... Uh, uh, collaborative way. Well, that's a um, very interesting perspective on how alternative funding can come into place. Let's also hear from traditional funders. Palavi, Standard Charter plays a critical role in traditional financing for large-scale offshore projects, including FPSOs. With a growing focus on energy transition, how are banks aligning their financing strategies to support both the current demand for offshore vessels and the longer-term shift towards greener energy solutions? So banks, <clears throat> banks and financial institutions are kind of increasingly required to justify their investment choices uh, in the wake of environmental and sustainability parameters. Um, this has caused quite a few organizations, quite a few banks, in particular European banks, to uh, revisit their position statements, um, and which is why we are at a state that, you know, uh, Andrew and Martin, we are talking about alternative uh, forms of funding. Um, at Standard Chartered, we, our key footprint geographies include a mix of both developed economies and emerging economies. Uh, what that does is it places a, sort of a responsibility on the bank where we believe in just transition uh, to net zero. Uh, what I say, what I mean about just transition is that the transition framework should be such that you, you are able to meet the climate objectives without depriving the emerging economies from, you know, making the best of the opportunities and prosper. Um, which is why we do have a very um, robust, I would say, transition finance framework in place. We've done quite a few FPSOs um, in, under this framework itself. It has quite a few things that we need to look at. Uh, but essentially, for us, um, it is important that we walk this, um, we walk this, uh, you know, this road of transition with our clients uh, if they are very focused on having a trans credible transition plan. Thank you so much. Also, I've got a second question, which is, from your perspective as a banker, how would you assess the risk-reward profile for FPSO financing in today's market, particularly with the push towards ESG and sustainability? And what are the key criteria that the bank considers before committing to a project? Uh, so a couple of variables out there. You have the FPSO financiers itself, which we, as we see is a smaller group. Um, the FPSOs now are bigger, better, hence costlier. Also, the cost comes from, you know, like Martin mentioned, uh, due to, uh, you know, inflation as well as uh, disruption itself. Uh, the third is environmental and sustainability uh, parameters, which are there. Um, the three criteria, which are, of course, not exhaustive, I would think is one is, uh, like Andrew talked about, is the bankability of the charter contract. Uh, we take uh, this part very seriously where we, as a lender group, we want to be informed on what are the risks that you're looking at, 
um, you know, what kind of force measure events are involved, are taken care of, what risks are open, are we taking oil price risk or field risk? Um, is there any termination of convenience? What's the termination fee? How's the lender group covered in such times? Is there risk of nationalization? All of these are typically brought about by a bankability study. You do have uh, the commercial considerations, uh, like Martin pointed out, there are, you know, you would have milestone payments from the charter, which uh, essentially the way we see it, um, the operator, FPSO owner, is able to pass on some of the construction risk, cost, um, you know, lending cost in this high interest regime onto the uh, charter itself. So you have the commercial considerations. You have the environmental and sustainability uh, framework in place. So those criteria would involve what is the kind of uh, technology that's going into this FPSO such that the carbon emissions are lower than, say, um, other FPSOs in the same field or other FPSOs of the same operator. Um, and then, of course, like I mentioned, um, and which is conclusively, is this a group that we want to uh, partner with in their own transition uh, plan? Actually, can I ask a question from the uh, sustainability and the environmental sure. technology perspective? So we sit somewhere in the middle of that kind of in, in a pressure point where in an ideal world we will put as much equipment on to reduce emissions as we possibly can. That obviously comes at a price and there will be a tolerance um, that our clients can bear as to whether they are willing to factor that into our capex and therefore the day rates. Now, so there's going to be that commercial sensitivity on that side. At the same time, the that uh, if, if banks are less willing to fund certain projects as a result, that may cause an impact which has uh, makes a project less viable. And consequently, the sources which would rely on that energy may have to look at more polluting um, sources of energy instead. How, um, how do you sleep at night thinking that? So, uh, you're, <laughs> you're right, Martin. Uh, it's, it's always somewhere in between, right? It's not black and white. Uh, where we look at is, and again, the, uh, the point of transition finance, and which is why probably very few are doing it, is that it, there's lack of uh, standards out there, taxonomies, regulations, etc. So we are trying to be, you know, one of the first to try and uh, try out this framework. So you could have, of course, I mean, when I talk about technology, uh, there's, there could be a carbon capture plant, uh, like in a go-go, for instance, um, or um, close flaring, um, innovative use, so that your power uh, generation is more effective. W what we are looking at is, um, if you were not to implement any of this, what would your carbon emissions be? So by implementing all of this, and maybe not all the 10 things which is going to make the whole project commercially unviable, but at least you know those four or five things which would make the carbon emissions lower than you know an FPS or a similar size in a similar field or nearby or of the group, then that's something that we are willing to put our bets on. I, I, I never thought I'd say this, but I also want to jump to your defense, Pulavi, to, to that <laughs> Thank question. You. I think banks who have taken a black or white interpretation on ESG have really given up their rights to participate in the game. So if you decide that we are no longer going to invest in FPSOs, you don't know whether the future FPSOs will be clean or dirty, whether they'll have the technology or not. You've, you've essentially rescinded your ticket to the ball. I think banks like Standard Chartered, where they have some degree of interpretation, and, and clearly the words that you've been talking about just transition, I think makes a lot of sense. And you can actually steer the ship in a way in terms of where do you deploy your capital, who within the industry is really making the right steps towards transition, whether or not they're black and white exactly the right moves, we're getting to the right place. And I think that probably addresses Martin's key concern is that at least they, they still have skin in the game. I'd also like to add, um, and interesting perspective actually that we gleaned from working on um, Yinsen's corporate financing, Andrew, actually that 
even though some banks can't directly support you on your FPSO projects, they may actually take part in your corporate financing so that even though they can't directly finance your FPSOs, they reach out the hand and lend you aid in an indirect manner by at least lending on a corporate basis so that you reserve your project financing for financiers who can actually take on that project financing. So I think even from that perspective, some of your traditional lenders who may not directly have the mandate have continued to support you. Um, I think that's also a rather interesting point. Um, so the last question I have would be for George. Um, George, from an investment and advisory perspective, how do you view the current state of the offshore market? And I mean, generally, given the cyclical nature of the offshore industry, where do you think we are in the business cycle and what advice would you have for offshore asset owners looking to take on new projects? I'll, I'll, I'll take the discussion a bit away from FPSO, uh, just a bit on uh, more general offshore. I think if, uh, if, we, were, uh, if we see in any other uh, subsector of shipping and uh, th there are assets in the, in the OSV space uh, that have over the course of the last uh, you know, two to three, two years, uh, they have even tripled in value. Um, there are there are there is a number of cases. So anyone would say that uh, you know if uh, in any other historical, uh, if you look at any other subsector historically, the one should feel that we are in the topish uh, uh, part. Uh, I think you know that's probably not the case, and it's pretty unique uh, for offshore and for the time uh, that we were living uh, now. One is there was such a prolonged. Um, uh, you know, lack of investment that led to lower assets and lack of capital, which we, we touched upon and I'll, I'll touch upon as well in a minute, uh, um, that drove asset prices in extremely low levels, uh, which actually made absolutely no, uh, no sense. So, you know, a big part of that move uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, rebounding is, is, you know, normalizing, right? I mean, I would say the biggest part, right? Um, and I don't think we are, you know, anywhere close to the, to the peak. Um, uh, simply because, uh, you know, in, in the best way to forecast the shipping uh, uh, market, or let's say the, the, the safest way, is by looking at supply. Uh, because demand is actually a very difficult thing to quantify. Um, uh, at least, you know, with great uh, degree of certainty. So, uh, you look at uh, all the, the, the OSV space, uh, there is still, you know, a relatively very small order book across the, I would say, the more conventional OSV sectors. Um, uh, uh, within, you know, either your PSVs, anchor handlers, uh, um, MPSVs. Of course, more are being built, but there is a, a, a significant uh, backlog that one needs to wait for these vessels to uh, effectively hit the water. The, the current fleet is quite old, um, because for the reasons that 10 years has been very limited investment. Uh, so I think, you know, you are, we are at the point where um, uh, still, there is significantly less vessels uh, uh, than, the, uh, than the market requires, and there is significantly even less younger vessels than the market requires, especially if you put the sustainability parameter uh, within, the, within the equation. So, um, so I think that, uh, you know, we, uh, it, we're definitely, you know, closer, I would say, you know, to... Uh, to, to, to averages, uh, uh, but you know, still for the for the same reasons, supply driven mainly with some way to go. So for many years, actually, we've seen a bit of a liquidity crunch in the OSV sector. Um, for past five, ten years, it's actually been almost impossible to finance OSVs, typically, especially second-hand OSVs. But with the significant surge in OSV prices in recent years, do you still see a continued? liquidity shortage and um, where can owners turn to for alternative liquidity given that um, you know, the ESG angle has actually made it difficult for some of the traditional funders to provide funding to OSVs? So we've been, I think, uh, with uh, Al Alandra uh, uh, has been focusing on raising capital um, across uh, all uh, shipping sectors but offshore has always been our one of our key, play, key areas of focus. Uh, uh, and we've been active uh, since, I would say, 2018, right? So, you know, even before the, uh, the boom, uh, the boom has started. Um, obviously, way less capital available only from alternative lenders uh, in the beginning and quite a few. I would say I could count them in, in, uh, in, in my one, one palm only. Uh, and, uh, uh, but looking, looking to today, there is, uh, I wouldn't say an efficient market yet. We're, I would say, far from that. 
um, uh, but there is, there is definitely um, a significantly higher number of alternative lenders that have come uh, into, uh, into play, uh, providing, you know, t taking more risk on the asset, obviously still looking at the cash flow as a primary driver of, uh, of analyzing the, the credit risk, uh, but looking at taking risk on the asset. Um, uh, uh, and we have, uh, we have started seeing selective uh, Chinese lessors uh, also looking at uh, second-hand uh, financing of, uh, uh, of offshore vessels. I'm talking about OSVs now, not, not FPSOs. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and I would say the, I would, the last six months, uh, very slowly, some European banks uh, with, uh, uh, if I can use this term, with a bit of a more flexible energy transition agenda, for lack of a better word, um, uh, being, you know, looking, at the, looking at the asset class uh, uh, as well uh, to, um, uh, to lend. So, uh, I think you know you, you definitely need capital in order to have asset prices move to the next level. Um, you don't just need the demand from charterers that is there, but capital is what uh, what will move uh, the market to the next uh, to the next stage. Um, and we're getting there. We're, st we're still not there. That's another reason why we're not at the peak. Also, as well. No my other. Um, yeah. Can you question. Speakers, yeah. what's their what's their views? That. Question for Palavi: Do would would SCB be interested in like financing the smaller OSVs, drilling rigs outside of the FPSOs which you mentioned? Because those are bespoke projects. But how about the more vanilla vessels, those that are more tradable and more liquid in the market? Uh, we have actually done a few jackup rigs earlier this year, so we are open. Uh, of course, we don't look at it as a single vessel on a single vessel basis. We don't look. We would not want to take metal risk. So the typical credit criteria continues. We want to understand the overall group's financials. Uh, you don't have long-term charter uh, charters in case of these smaller vessels, right? So what, ha what happens if there is no charter, et cetera? Uh, so we look at the overall uh, financials of the company, and uh, we, we are open for business. Thank you. So I think we are running short of time. So we will end off this session um, by getting a little nugget of wisdom from each panelist. So can we start with you, Martin? Basically, it sounds like there's no easy option to, uh, to finance uh, offshore, whether it's uh, OSVs, drilling, FPSOs. Um, it's a, e e e each project is unique and uh, has to be looked at on its own merits. I agree with you, um, but I, I think my message is that capital is much more available than it used to be, um, and uh, you know pe people should explore the, the the financing market has become way more global in shipping over you know over the last ten years, um, uh, and uh, I think the offshore also offers, uh, compared to other uh, other subsectors, uh, uh, it's th there is much more corporate enhancement as as you say there's balance behind many cases where there are balances behind the companies. You don't have the usual, you know, dry bulk or tanker structures, which, you know, practically are non recall structures. So it's uh, on paper, while it is a more liquid sector and volatile, uh, it should be, uh, you know, equally financeable. Palavi? Keep it short. Um, we do believe that, you know, industries such as FPSO, FLNG, et cetera, are very disciplined ones. Uh, we are, we continue to be interested in these assets. Uh, good charters, bankable charters, um, sacrosanct cash flows, etc. Uh, we continue to be interested in these. Thank you, Andrew. I don't think I'm legally allowed to give investment advice, but if I was a qualified institutional buyer, I would certainly consider investing in FPO credit because you're getting 100 to 200 basis points in increased yield, and you're getting a better credit rating than the underlying charterer. So that seems to like a good trade to me. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for your time. Thank you, ladies Thank you. and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the panel discussion. Thank you.